Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Helene Miller. I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist in Paramus, New Jersey. I'd like to share with you today some helpful tips to work towards achieving better mental health in your daily life. Before I get started, I'd like to thank today's co-sponsors, Family Psychiatry and Therapy of Paramus, providing a wide range of compassionate behavioral health services delivered by telephone and video in the comfort of your own home. Our other wonderful sponsor is Arista Care Health Services, delivering the highest quality post-acute inpatient rehabilitation, memory care, and long-term care services in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Today I'd like to share with you tips and strategies for you and your loved ones to promote better mental health, identify the warning signs, when to seek help, and to explore various reasons why it's sometimes difficult for some people to even seek assistance. As a psychiatrist, a large part of my practice focus is to help provide individuals with tools and strategies to achieve better mental health in their daily lives. Our goal is to teach you to have the tools in the toolbox so that you have the means to wake up every single day with a good plan to move closer to better mental health. Today we're going to talk about a few topics, but I'd like to highlight mental health prevention, when to seek help, and stigmas that may impact someone's ability to seek mental health treatment. I'd first like to talk today about prevention. There's many ways that you could become your best advocate towards mental health. Let's start by summarizing some of the things that can be prognosticators for better mental health outcomes. And I will take a moment to discuss and elaborate on each of those. One of those is social connections. The other is exercise. The other is sleep hygiene. And the other last one is nutrition and diet habits. These are your personal tools, if you will, for a path to better mental health. Now I'd like to take a moment to touch on each of them. Relationships, good relationships are the cornerstone of promoting good mental health. If you don't have a strong mental health network or a good support system, that's okay. Not everyone needs a lot of friends or family to feel supported. You're already in good shape if you're just thinking about it. And if you don't have a strong social health network, it's important to find things and seek out things that are interesting to you so that you can surround yourself with people who have common ideas and a sense of community. You could, for example, become involved in your church, mosque, synagogue, or community center. You can volunteer at an organization that's meaningful for you, such as an animal shelter or a food bank. You could volunteer to teach English to someone at a local library. Really. It's, it's endless, whatever is your interest. Many schools are looking for volunteers to share things about former careers or skill sets. Join a social club, sometimes a local community center or a YMCA or even a library has many activities and events that will at least enable you to get out of the house, take a chance, meet new people and learn a new skill. But if you're retired, you might want to consider getting a part-time job for an organization that's meaningful to you, where you don't have to worry so much about the career path, but more the personal path. You can learn a new skill. The fortunate thing now is we're living in an era where there are apps to learn a new language, to learn a new video game, or any topic of interest to you. Find that moment to learn something new. Learn how to cook a new cuisine, learn how to garden. Planting is associated very much and gardening with better mental health outcomes. You can take on a new hobby. Some people enjoy collecting, some people enjoy crafting. Find your passion, find something that looks fun and go for it. Visiting people. Sometimes we forget how easy it is to get in the car or get on a Zoom or a FaceTime call to visit with family, grandchildren, old friends from our younger years. Try to rekindle those connections if you can. You can also join many online groups that are socially distanced. Today, many lectures and groups and group events are done by Zoom or video conferencing. There's very good websites out there in which you can connect to people with shared interests. So if you have people in your life, whether friends or family or people with shared interests, you really want to try to connect to them and not be isolated. However, the converse is true as well. If there's people in your life or 
groups of people or family members or coworkers that are really not beneficial to your mental health and your well-being and they bring you down, it's important to learn to set boundaries and limits and maybe try to create some distance and some space in order to keep yourself mentally healthy. Studies after studies show that regular meaningful exercise as well has a variety of benefits. Now I would like to talk about physical activity and how that can promote better mental health. Research shows that exercise is effective, but it's often underutilized in treatment for even mild and moderate depression. What that means is we're forgetting to just get out of the house and take a walk, as simple as that sounds. Regular exercise has been proven to reduce stress and anxiety, as well as improve sleep, and we'll touch on sleep in a few moments. There's really no data that there's one special or particular kind of exercise that you need to do. As long as you can get out of the house and get moving and increase your heart rate once you're cleared by your medical doctor to do so, it can be beneficial. Depression is many times treated as a multimodal approach and increasing your physical activity to decrease your anxiety, decrease your depression, and those dark days can be very useful. Please don't forget to check with your healthcare provider before starting any type of exercise program. In addition, exercise can reduce aches and pains that come from muscle stiffness or deconditioning, and it can also help to prevent all of the seasonal weight gain that we've had from being cooped up inside during the colder months. Exercise is also important because it's proven to boost self-esteem and benefit your mental health overall. Current studies suggest that the ideal amount of exercise, and again, it's ideal, is four to five times a week. If you are a beginner, start with 10 minutes, build up to 20, get to 30. But remember, any amount of exercise is better than none. If you have five minutes, take five minutes to take a walk. Take five minutes to take a brisk run. Take five minutes to do jumping jacks or put on a YouTube video to do some online online Zumba or an exercise video or a dance video, just get moving. 10 minute brisk walks, what we also know as energy walks, can also help to improve mood. Just feeling the cold air on your skin and getting your heart rate up can help you get out of whatever you might have been stuck thinking about that might have caused your mood to go down. And if you eventually can get up to walking 30 minutes, five days a week, that's wonderful. For optimum physical and mental health, most people need sleep. Sounds pretty obvious, right? But we really need somewhere between six to nine hours of sleep on a daily basis and to not accrue what's known as a sleep deficit. Many people have trouble to fall asleep and this can become a snowball effect. You have trouble to fall asleep. You're up late at night with your thoughts. Then you're anxious, then you're sleep deprived, then you're depressed and this can become a, a very troublesome bothersome and sad cycle. So insomnia and depression and anxiety sometimes do go together. So how do we remedy sleep hygiene? How do we get good quality sleep at night without feeling pressured to lie there and just fall asleep? We frequently do find insomnia in patients with a variety of mental health issues that are not limited to anxiety, panic, and depression. In fact, sleep disturbances are some of the core symptoms of clinical depression. More than 80% of people who suffer from depression will report a trouble with their sleep. It's two-way street, however, because sleep deprivation and insomnia also interact and can increase a person's risk of developing depression or experiencing a relapse or recurrence of depression. Many people feel there's very little we can do to increase our sleep or to have better sleep. We're either going to sleep or we're not going to sleep. However, this is not always the case. There's many things we can do to improve our quality of sleep. We can practice better sleep hygiene techniques. I'm going to review a few of them. Hopefully some of these will be easy to implement and you can practice because practice makes perfect. Go to bed at the same time every night. Get up at the same time every day. Find a time that works for you and really try to hold yourself to this. This continuity, this scheduling creates much more regularity in our lives. Allow for eight hours minimum of sleep a night. 
For example, go to bed at 11 p.m. and wake up at 7 a.m. And of course, you would adjust that based on your work and family schedules. Turn devices down. Turn down the lights. Turn down the volume. Turn down the activities at night. Start to think a few hours before bedtime. How do I wind down? What do I have to do? Try to be away from computer screens and phone screens and bright lights. Create an environment where you're in the dark when you sleep. If you have to take medication to help you sleep, take your medicine about one hour before bedtime. For most people, these medicines take between 30 to 60 minutes to kick in. So give the medicine time to work before you're lying in bed. Most importantly, find a nighttime activity that's relaxing for you and do that activity about an hour before bedtime. Some people enjoy reading. Some people like to listen to a relaxing music. Some people wind down by listening to nature sounds. Fortunately, you can find these easily on your phone, on the internet, or with uh, Google searches. Some people enjoy knitting or crafting or something quiet where they can do it somewhere either in the bedroom or in bed or right before they go to sleep. If you have a hobby and the hobby brings you joy and relaxes you, try that an hour before bed. Some people like to write their day down or their thoughts in a journal. This has been proven also to help people to put their thoughts in a place so that they're not dealing with racing thoughts when they're trying to go to sleep. Others take a warm bath and they do things that are relaxing and help them to feel that they can calm down enough and quiet their mind to have a good night of sleep. Some people if I were to circle back to journaling, like to lie in bed at night, and one exercise you could do is to make a mental list of things that you're thankful for. Taking an inventory of your gratitude can sometimes help to soothe us and help us to fall asleep in a better mood. You can write your worries in a journal or just set them aside mentally. Plan to think about them another time. We can choose our time to worry. You can get in bed and think, okay, I'm worried about this thing, but I'm going to worry about it tomorrow and I'm going to set that aside. Or write it out in your journal so that you don't forget about it. Other important tips for falling asleep better and having a better quality of sleep include avoiding caffeine four to six hours before sleep time. So afternoon cups of coffee, think about having decaf. Avoid alcohol at night. Alcohol is a depressant that may induce sleep but will disrupt it later and can cause you to wake up not just with a hangover, but in an anxious or depressed mood. Avoid consuming a heavy meal before bedtime. Ideally, you would like to give your body a few hours to digest your meal so that all of your system can work on soothing your mind at night so that you wake up refreshed. A light carbohydrate snack a few hours before bedtime is fine, but try to avoid simple or refined sugars if possible. Sleep hygiene also includes regular exercise. So regular exercise, as I talked about before, during the day has been proven to increase your ability to fall asleep. You can fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and have better quality sleep overall if you are to incorporate exercise into your daily routine. But try to avoid exercise really within an hour of bedtime because it might make you too revved up to settle down. Select a comfortable mattress, pillow, sheets, and clothing. Studies show that going to sleep a few degrees temperature below what you might be used to in the rest of the house can help for inducing a good night's sleep. Keep the room temperature cool to moderate. Keep the bedroom quiet. So you can wear earplugs or use a white noise machine or even think about a fan which would blow air and create some white noise and make sure that you remove any bright clocks from your view so that you're not staring at the clock late at night. Now I would like to talk about nutrition and diet. While many people understand the connection between nutrition and a physical disease state, fewer people are aware of the connection between good nutrition and helping to prevent or reduce depression. Depression is more strictly thought of to most people as a general emotional state or a biochemical state, something that we can't influence without medication or therapy. But nutrition, however, can help play a key role in the onset, severity, and duration of depression. This includes even daily mood swings. 
by looking at what we eat, how we eat it, when we eat it, we can hopefully avoid the mood swings that come with fluctuations in blood sugar. Many of the same food patterns that precede depression are the same food patterns that, are, that occur during depression. These patterns might include things like skipping meals, having a low appetite, missing our scheduled meal times, and then overeating or craving sweets and simple sugars. People who follow extremely low carbohydrate diets will also run the risk of feeling depressed. And that's because brain chemicals that promote a feeling of well-being need to have a steady level of carbohydrates and sugars that feed them. The goal is to avoid sugars that are too simple, but to lean towards more complex carbohydrates, such as fruits and vegetables. So we want to, again, avoid things that are heavy on processed foods and heavy on simple sugars. A number of studies have also shown that vitamin deficiencies are more prevalent among subjects with depression compared to people who don't have depression. Vitamin deficiencies that have been found include vitamin B1 deficiency, B6, and B12, as well as folate deficiency. Many people have a genetic predisposition to metabolize folic acid and the precursors differently than others. Sometimes there is a genetic basis for inability to process certain vitamins and substances the way others do. Besides some of the other functions of vitamins, these substrates also play important roles in neurotransmitter mechanisms. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals or the building blocks that the brain uses to send signals from one cell to another. As a matter of fact, medications for mood disorders such as depression or anxiety are based on increasing the ability of these neurotransmitters to be used for the cells to communicate with one another. Even folic acid deficiency at a low dose can cause personality or mood changes. So we can test for that and we can remedy that with medical grade folic acid supplements. Vitamin B12, even at marginally low levels, can also contribute to depression and even memory issues. Folic acid deficiency is actually one of the most common vitamin deficiencies in the United States. Not only is it easily destroyed by cooking vegetables, but it's mostly abundant in leafy green vegetables if you're looking to supplement your folic acid. As we age, vitamin B12 may not be absorbed as readily, even if the recommended daily requirement is ingested. Minerals that play a role in the development or prevention of depression, irritability, and mood swings include other supplements as well, including calcium, iron, magnesium, selenium, and zinc. You can check with your doctor if you have any vitamin deficiencies, and then your doctor could talk with you about how to add substances to your diet that will remedy the situation. So I'm going to highlight now some bullet points about diet and nutrition. The bottom line is that proper nutrition really does play a key role in maintaining good, positive mental health. Foods to eliminate or eat in moderation include sugar, sugary food, and excess caffeine, although a cup or two of coffee a day is okay if you check with your doctor. Get into the habit of eating at least three meals a day, and don't skip breakfast. Replace sweets that you might have with other things, such as vegetables or fruits or whole grain carbohydrates. Eat lean sources of protein several times a day. Fish is rich in omega acids as well, and you may want to incorporate eating fatty fish such as salmon two times a week as well. Drink plenty of water. If you can drink eight ounces of water eight times a day, that would really be great. Focus on a well-balanced diet, including various foods from all of the food groups. Eat plenty of leafy greens, because they are high in folic acid. Eat bananas, avocados, chicken, greens, and whole grains in order to boost your vitamin B6. If you're concerned about getting enough of your key nutrients, talk to your physician or have a consult with a dietitian to discuss what deficiencies may be getting in the way of you having better mental health. So now I'd like to focus on when to seek help. 
When does not feeling well become so critical that it's important to reach out? And this is really an important topic because for many people, unfortunately, they seek help too late when so many things have taken a turn for the worse in their life. So depression, anxiety, rage, or other mental or emotional conditions, these are very real and serious conditions. And when they become extreme or serious, they do require professional assistance and help to get people better and move towards a remission. You should seek mental health treatment anytime that you feel yourself experiencing any out of control impulses, out of control thoughts, or emotional feelings, or emotional feelings that lead to dangerous behaviors that cause you to feel out of control or even overwhelmed and sometimes suicidal. If you feel like there's no end in sight or you're a burden or you're having severe feelings of guilt, please, I urge you, reach out for help. I'd like to take a few moments to just highlight a few things that might help to identify when you or a loved one might be in a position to seek out mental health treatment. If you're having trouble to function or cope in your day-to-day -day life and you're not showing up for work or able to take care of yourself or your family, you need help. And it is important if you can't reach out for help or make the phone call to ask a trusted friend or family member to help you. You should also consider mental health treatment if you or your family notices that you're having extreme swings in your mood. Extreme mood swings, while here and there might not be something of significance, if they're happening more frequently, it's important to seek mental health treatment. If you feel sad, blue, helpless, hopeless, more often than not, that can signal signs of depression, and depression can get worse. So while you're still in a position to identify that you're not well and you have insight into the severity of your condition or there are others around you who might have more insight into your condition, please listen to them and listen to yourself and seek mental health treatment. If you're someone who worries all the time and you feel anxious and you don't feel safe, Perhaps your anxiety is overwhelming you, and it might be smart, again, to seek out mental health treatment. Aside from asking your family or friends, it's always a good thought to call your primary care provider and ask for a referral. And if you feel that you're very extreme and can't wait for an appointment, getting in with your primary care provider is a good way to bridge treatment. That also speaks for going to your local emergency room or urgent care center. If you feel that you don't know where to turn to or what to do, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You can call a suicide prevention hotline or you could really just go to a local emergency room or urgent care and they can guide you and direct the appropriate treatment for your mental health. If you are seriously considering suicide or you've contemplated suicide or you're thinking about ways to commit suicide, I urge you, please get some help. Just having those kind of thoughts indicates that your mind is in a darker place and getting some help now might be much more of an attempt to save your life or save the life of a loved one once we are aware that you're contemplating suicide. If you find that you're turning to substances to cover up your pain, your anxiety, your depression, your feelings of hopelessness, or even to quiet a racing mind that's so out of control or keeping you from sleeping, this is something that's very urgent. So if you're using alcohol, drugs, street drugs, taking someone else's pills, or even abusing over-the-counter medications, please, if you're looking to numb your emotional pain, get some help. If you feel or other people are describing you as a ticking time bomb and you feel like you don't know if you're going to snap or have a breakdown or you're afraid of what you're going to do next, please, I urge you, get some help. Reach out to a family member or a friend or someone at your job or if your job has an employee assistance line, you can call your insurance company, you can call your priest, your rabbi, your imam, Whoever can help you, whoever you feel safe with, please reach out to a trusted person. If you're a young person, 
a teacher, a guidance counselor, a school psychologist, social worker. If you're a college student, the college guidance, anyone, there's resources that you can reach out to all the time. And again, calling a suicide hotline is an important first step. It's free and it's confidential. If you also find that you are in a toxic relationship where you're being abused and you're afraid, you're afraid to speak out, you're afraid this person's going to punish you, find a trusted friend who can work with you on getting to safety and getting your needs met from a mental health perspective. Again, as we speaked about uh, nutrition and diet before, if you find that you're overeating, undereating, or have unusual food habits that are at either extreme, it's time to seek out professional mental health treatment. Now, it's hard to talk about seeking mental health treatment without talking about why people don't seek mental health treatment. Frequently, that is due to the stigma of mental health. Unfortunate as it is, there is a still great stigma associated with people who require mental health treatment and even more so with people who seek the services of a psychiatrist or people who have to take medications to maintain proper mental health. Despite the fact that millions of Americans see therapists and psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners, it can still be difficult for people to ask for help. Social stigma or simple misunderstandings about mental health or counseling or psychiatry involves people whose lives are affected because they're afraid to get the resources that they need in order to get better and in order to stay safe. Having a fear to see a therapist, a counselor, or a psychiatrist or nurse practitioner is a common feeling and it stems from both sides of the equation. You may think that having a mental health issue is a sign of weakness. People in your family might discourage you from it. They may tell you that you shouldn't have a record of this or that no one should know about it or there's shame in it or they may feel that if you have a problem then they did something wrong and none of that could be farther from the truth. Mental health is like all other things that affect us. Mental illness is just like any other illness and nobody is immune from suffering and nobody is immune from needing treatment. You may also feel embarrassed to seek mental health treatment. You might be afraid that someone finds out that you've visited a counselor or a therapist or a psychiatrist. In any case, seek help. It could save your life. And rest assured that you can work through this, overcome your fear or embarrassment or shame and do what you deserve. Get the help that you or your loved one needs. The first step in really overcoming your fear, if you are hesitant, is to identify it. What is holding me back from getting help for myself, my parent, my child, or my loved one? Once you know what that fear is, whether it's shame, anxiety, stigma, or fear of being able to afford it, uh, it's important that you try to get past that seek out resources. Many resources in mental health are free. Many free hotlines can guide you towards finding something that is within an affordable price range. Once you know what that roadblock is to seeking mental health, you can restore a sense of certainty that you deserve help and that your family and loved ones deserve help as well. So to overcome your fear of sitting down with a therapist, sitting down with a psychiatrist, ask yourself, would you dread the interaction? What's really holding you back? Could you feel better? Can you imagine being in a place where you feel better, where you feel that you're getting treatment, that you're not in such a dark place, that there is hope? If you can imagine getting back to a point where you have hope in your life, you're on the right path. So we've all experienced terrifying situations. You might have memories of scary experiences early in your life that have lingered into adulthood. Those things hold us back, but nonetheless, they're real and they contribute to our adult lives. These memories carry significant weight because they may contain the key to overcoming your fear and the roadblock to seeking mental health. Think back to a similar time in your life when you would have wanted help and things held you back. 
Maybe you had an unpleasant memory of going to the dentist or felt that you were in the principal's office and you were in trouble because you were getting something escalated to a higher level. From there, think about how you successfully handled the situation. You made it out of the dentist's chair, you made it out of the principal's office, and you made it out of that flu shot that you were so afraid of. The act of recalling a victory over a simple, similar unknown can be a very empowering exercise as you approach your first therapy session. Remind yourself, you've done difficult things before, you've encountered frightening situations before, and you have overcome them. These experiences are a proven track record to your other abilities to overcome further and similar difficult situations. What is psychiatry? Psychiatry is a medical specialty that isn't as understood as other medical specialties. Unfortunately, this lack of understanding combined with negative portrayals either from the news or media or our own personal bias towards people with mental illness or addiction creates a social stigma and it makes people very wary about seeing a psychiatrist and being lumped into that category to which they also recognize the stigma. Because of this lack of understanding, this also leads to the perpetuation of certain myths about being someone who seeks mental health treatment. These myths are very dangerous. These myths are roadblocks to treatment. These myths are roadblocks to saving people's lives and improving the lives of children and adults and seniors. Here are some common myths that can be thought of as roadblocks and misunderstandings to seeking mental health treatment. One myth, psychiatrists are for crazy people, people who are insane or violent. They're not for the rest of us. Well, that's not true. The fact is, contrary to popular belief, most people who see a psychiatrist are not crazy. Although there are some individuals who might require a higher level of care than others, most patients who see a psychiatrist go to work on chemical imbalances and symptoms that are many times treated very well with a combination of medication and therapy or therapy alone. Another myth, if you see a psychiatrist, you'll be forced to take psychiatric medicines. Well, I can speak to that because I'm a psychiatrist. Unless you're involuntarily hospitalized and there's a court order, nobody is going to force you to take medication. I'll say that again. If you see a psychiatrist, generally, unless you're on a court order, on an involuntary hold, which is very rare, and it's a very specific legal process, nobody is going to force you to take psychiatric medications. Many people respond just to therapy. As a psychiatrist, my first line is really to use therapy. When medications are appropriate and they can speed up the recovery, we will add medications if you're willing to take them. So. I'd like to really bust that myth open. Not everybody who sees a psychiatrist walks out with a prescription for medication. Another myth, psychi psychiatric drugs will alter your personality. They'll change who you are. I hear that a lot. People will say, well, doc, I want help for the depression, but I don't want people to not know who I am. I don't want to not recognize myself. Well, that's not the case. On an outpatient basis, if you're going to see a psychiatrist and you're going to get medication, the medication will help you to feel less sad. It will help you to feel less anxious. It will help you to sleep better. And remember, you're still you. You're just you sleeping better, less anxious, and less depressed. Another myth is psychiatrists classify normal emotions as mental illness. And this is something, again, that I encounter a lot. We've all been depressed. We've all been anxious. Most of us at some point have felt fearful or even panicky. I'm sure all of us as well have had nights where we haven't slept well. All of those things in isolated moments do not constitute a bona fide mental illness. So if you're feeling sad, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're suffering from a major mental illness. But if you're feeling so sad that your functioning is impaired or you're having more days than good days, then seeking mental health treatment can help you to overcome that. Don't be afraid of symptoms. Symptoms such as mood swings, anxiety, panic, depression, do not necessarily constitute, in all cases, a major mental illness or a huge psychiatric diagnosis. In certain 
situations, these are harbingers of something greater. But many times people who seek mental health treatment seek it to deal with very garden variety symptoms such as anxiety and depression, panic and sleep. Don't be afraid to seek mental health treatment and to be pigeonholed because you are not your diagnosis. You are so much more than that. When you have a strep throat, you don't become the strep throat. And the same is with psychiatric diagnoses. You are a person. And any good mental health practitioner will look at you 360 and holistically, understanding the stressors in your life and the things that lead to your anxiety and depression. Another common myth is that psychiatric drugs are forever. Many patients say to me, Doc, you know, I don't mind taking something now for depression, but how long do I have to be on this? Or my child has ADHD and can't focus. How long do they have to take this? And the answer is psychiatric medication in most cases is not forever. You are in control. If you take medication for depression and you reach a remission, your doctor could work with you on weaning down the medication. Same for anxiety. If you're not sleeping and you develop good sleep hygiene habits and your sleep is better, you don't have to take sleep medication forever. Every diagnosis has a different treatment plan. And that's why it's important when you meet with your mental health provider to have them answer these questions. But not all medication is forever. Again, a large majority of people who are treated that go into remission can look at lowering their doses of medication or even coming off medication. And this should not hold you back from seeking treatment. So as you can see, there's many myths surrounding mental health treatment. Hopefully we've explored some of these myths and we've been able to bust through these myths and understand why if you seek mental health treatment, you're going to be okay and you will be in control at all times of who you're speaking to and the medicines that you're taking. At the end of the day, mental health conditions affect everyone, whether directly or indirectly. We know people or we've been affected ourselves. And by reducing the stigma and taking away the shame, we can not only benefit ourselves and our families, but we could work towards the greater goal of erasing the stigma of mental health. And we can change this and help empower people to approach mental health treatment with less fear. I would like to thank everyone who has sponsored this program, Family Psychiatry and Therapy, Arista Healthcare. Thank you so much for allowing me the ability to share a little bit about what mental health treatment is, how to stay healthy, and how to erase the stigma of mental health. Have an enjoyable day and take care.